Donald Downs, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm the uh, <clears throat> president of the uh, Committee for Academic Freedom and Rights at Wisconsin. Uh, we're linked to FIRE. Uh, they have a much better acronym than we do. Ours is KFAR. Uh, but we try to do well anyway. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I just got in late last night from Florida, and I leave for D.C. first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and, I, and I only got to look at the, um, the case study some, basically yesterday. I'm like, ooh, fun, defending Bill Ayers. <laughs> So if, if, you've, if you've read it, um, it's, a, it's a very real problem that we see on campuses. Um, that you, that, uh, and it, it's, it's become so predictable that we at FIRE actually <laughs> refer to this as disinvitation season. Uh, that people get invited and they get discouraged from coming. And I, and I would like to point out, overwhelmingly, it's not the Bill Ayers who are the ones who are getting disinvited or who are getting pressured to not to be invited in the first <laughs> place. Um, ben Carson, uh, that just happened at Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. Um, uh, I, 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 there was a lot of waves about um, the way it worked with Ann Coulter uh, in, in recently. I was, I, was in a, I was interviewed for a Wall Street Journal piece about this. And, it's a, and that's a particularly interesting case because it really was, and, I, and my, my position on it was more nuanced, I think, than the Wall Street Journal quite, quite understood. But the university president came out, and while we do say that university presidents have the right to say, we don't particularly like this speaker, you know, but we'll let them speak anyway, the, the president uh, uh, of Fordham went so far in the direction of saying this is a test for these students, it shows a lack of maturity for these students, it really was something that it would take an especially brave student group to maintain their, um, uh, their invitation <coughs> to, to Ann Coulter. And they uh, decided to actually, and then unsurprisingly, shortly after this came out, the, the Republican club disinvited, uh, disinvited Ann Coulter. Um, so it's a very interesting case. And also, by the way, uh, when some people who get disinvited or uh, groups that get in trouble for uh, inviting controversial speakers include me. Uh, <laughs> I, I spoke at Temple once, um, and uh, the, the, uni the organization that, that invited me ended up getting uh, put on probation because they had not warned uh, the, the Temple community that someone as uh, controversial as Greg Lukianoff would be speaking on campus. Well, it really boils down to the acronym, I think. <laughs> And it was amazing because it was a, such a, it was such an incredibly you know tame speech. The the, the 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 armed guard that they send to protect me ended up sitting in the front row and just listening because there was nothing. There well, was Greg, nothing I've heard you me. speak. You're not tame. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm pretty tame. Um, but I think the the, the interesting thing are, are the um, are, are the people who never get invited <coughs> in the first place. Oh, and of course, David Horowitz <laughs> has a history of getting disinvited or co people coming up with excuses for for disinviting him. But but the um, uh, the heirs case I think is interesting because um, and it, this might even be a point of dis of, of s s some amount of disagreement. Um, I'm a big Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, uh, so the way that I refer to my take on on universities that there is is that there's when it's a when the uh, when the group that uh, invited you um, decides that they no longer want to have you come. Right. They have the right to do that, and I call this the vampire rule because the idea is once you invite a vampire in your house, they can always get into your house. Uh, th that's <laughs> not a real thing. <laughs> now that being said, if you choose to invite somebody though, and you disinvite them for bad reasons, we will <laughs> fire. Will sometimes make fun of you for that, and and sometimes you'll be right, rightly uh, r rightly embarrass yourself. But the real <laughs> issue comes in when a student group, for example, and this and this also this, <laughs> this is why this is a gr good case example when a student group invites a particular speaker and is essentially overruled by the administration <laughs> saying you can't have that speaker, uh, speaker on our campus, then it becomes an infringement of the student's rights and right. it turns into a case that ultimately uh, th the campus is going to lose in court if it's a public college. Okay, okay very good. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know who Bucky the Vampire Slayer uh, is. B Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> uh, I am a fan of Bucky Badger. A <laughs> um, couple interesting points in the background here and then I want to pose a, a hypothetical that case of a speaker. Uh, first of all, this is an example of the old kind of censorship, the old kind of academic freedom problem, uh, which until the 1960s, in the period that uh, Neil Hamilton talks about in his book, uh, be begins the era of progressive censorship, censorship in the name of progressive causes. And uh, the threat to academic freedom almost entirely in history came from the outside. At least that was the main thrust of it. And what started happening in the 60s and then picked up steam in the 80s as uh, Ben O'Schmidt has talked about, <coughs> is the threat from within the university. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot harder to deal with right. because you're talking about your fellow colleagues and you have to go after them, you have to organize. And it's, I always sort of uh, use the metaphor, uh, it's like a cancer. 
because the problem comes from within and it's harder to deal with. And I think that's one reason uh, we haven't got a handle on this problem yet because not enough groups are willing to stand up and do the kinds of things that Benno Schmidt has talked about. So uh, that, that thing's one issue. Another point is that, notice the political influence here. Uh, you had a politician getting involved in the Wyoming case, <coughs> a U.S. Senator. Uh, Madison, uh, the UW system, uh, a few years ago, Ward Churchill was invited to UW uh, uh, Whitewater. You're smiling, you know the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. And actually, I was really kind of happy about it because it was the first time that I'm the head of KFAR. We've had a lot of cases over the years. And uh, so he's the first person on the left that we had to defend. So I was able to sort of show that we were nonpartisan. And we got involved in that case. Uh, <clears throat> the state legislature, a guy named Steve Nass from Whitewater, uh, uh, who was the head of the education committee in the assembly, threatened publicly to defund the university because of Ward Churchill. A few years later, we had another case you may have heard of, Kevin Barrett. He's one of the original 9-11 truthers. Do you all know what that is? George Bush was behind 9-11. And he was given a one-year contract, as a, a one-semester contract as a lecturer. And because of, and, and we had evidence that he was going to teach the course in an open-minded way. He was actually a pretty good teacher. He was just, you know, out there on these other issues. And uh, the legislature threatened to defund us again because of that. Governor Doyle, a Democrat, uh, threatened the same thing, or I don't know if he threatened the same thing, but he also opposed him teaching and made public statements about how he shouldn't be teaching. And we came to the defense of Kevin Barrett, though that was a controversial case because uh, I got email from all over the world uh, uh, attacked by people on Barrett's side because I talked about how I disagreed with his theory very strongly. <clears throat> I got attacked by more traditional academic responsibility people because they said, this is not academic freedom, this is academic license. They said it was akin to believing the world is flat. So maybe the Barrett case would be something to talk about as, you know, it's a gray area. We defended him because there was no evidence he would be a bad teacher, and uh, he'd also taught before, and because he had a contract. Uh, <clears throat> so we ended up prevailing on that case, but it, the university took a big hit with it. <clears throat> and finally, there's a <clears throat> distinction in a, a Supreme Court case, uh, the Pico case, uh, between uh, this case involving a book being removed from a school library. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Justice Brennan, I think, right, wrote the opinion. And Brennan said that it's one thing for the court to overview or oversee uh, library acquisition because there's editorial discretion on the part of librarians, just like a newspaper would have discretion what they want to print. But when a book is removed, it raises the specter of censorship because given human experience, when there's removal, there's usually a motivated reason behind it, which is often ideological and political. Mm -hmm. So he said when it comes to library book removal in the face of a political movement, uh, the court's going to give that more judicial scrutiny than a case of initial acquisition. And I think that's relevant to these kinds of cases uh, as well. Now let me pose, you know, what if you invited the Ku Klux Klan to come speak? I had a former student, grad student in Colorado. She did that. And it was a, a college where they had a lot of Native Americans. And the Klan in that area <coughs> actually was very vociferous, anti-Native uh, American. <clears throat> she brought him to speak and, needless to say, all hell broke loose. But she ended up losing her job. Uh, what would you do about a case like that? Uh, Ayers, I wouldn't say he's quite in the same category as the Ku Klux Klan, uh, though I have certainly, I'm not going to give him much credit. Uh, so I'll leave you with that sort of thought or question. I have a view that I'd be very interested in Don and Greg's view of. What, what is the responsibility in the kinds of cases that you've been talking about uh, of the university president or dean or whoever is uh, the responsible academic official? And I think what I would say, I would also say applies to trustees. My view about student groups that <laughs> invite unpopular speakers is not that it should just be left to the students. My view is that once an invitation is issued, that it becomes the affirmative duty of the university administration to protect that speaker, to do whatever it takes, to bring in the university police, bring in the regular police, do whatever it takes uh, to protect the 
the opportunity for that student group to go ahead and not to have a kind of free for all where other student groups can jump on them and bully them or deans can bully them or 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 uh, whatever so in, in that sense i think once uh, uh, since i believe that this is not what everyone believes uh, by any means that students do have academic freedom mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, traditionally, it was viewed, you know, students did not. I don't see how it's possible to take that view right. in, an era, in an era where students are viewed as uh, active, you know, participants in their own education. And part of that freedom, it, it seems to me, uh, is, includes inviting uh, any speakers they want, so long as the speakers don't violate, you know, uh, uh, laws against uh, threats and assaults or obscenity or whatever uh, whatever it is a and that um, uh, once a student or a single student could do this wouldn't have to be a group once a student decides to invite whether it's Ayers or Ann Coulter I don't care General Westmoreland um, mm -hmm. uh, it then becomes the affirmative duty mm -hmm. of the administration and the trustees to protect that no matter what it costs, it, just in the same way as they would protect the library from being burned down. Okay. Uh, I, when I was at Yale, I actually said, uh, if someone wants to invite the Klan, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, there are no points of view that are out of line here, so long as what we're talking about is discussion. Now, I'm not talking about the right of the Klan, you know, to burn a cross or, or threaten anybody uh, outright. Yeah. Well, I, I, yes, I would agree with that as long as you don't uh, uh, try to seek that balance in a way that is preventing the controversial speaker from getting uh, his or her uh, point of view out there. And I, I would also say uh, that uh, uh, when I say that administrations should become affirmatively committed to protecting the rights of unpopular speakers, I do not mean that administrators themselves can't criticize right. the speaker or, 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 or it may be that that should come afterward so students and other groups don't misunderstand that you're inviting them to, uh, you know, upset this, uh, uh, this occasion. But the affirmative duty to protect it doesn't mean that the administrators aren't free and in my view actually have a responsibility to uh, to state their own differing point of view from, from that of a controversial speaker if they happen to disagree. Uh, and, for example, as Lee Bollinger did at Columbia after the uh, uh, Iran president, that maniac, uh, uh, came, came to the Columbia campus, uh, and I, I thought it was right for that invitation to go out, but it was also w well within Lee's freedom and, and indeed responsibility to criticize the position that that, uh, that, that fellow took. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's something that I think sometimes gets left out. First of all, uh, you know, 999 times out of 1,000, the Klan example comes up, and I've never seen a case where, it's, uh, this is the first I've heard of someone actually inviting a Klan member to, to, to campus. The, and, and this is the, the, the idea is, it is that, uh, that, you know, not to get too theoretical about it, but fr freedom of speech and academic freedom are basically anarchical systems. Um, and the idea is kind of like, do you trust experts more, or do you trust things to win out in the battle of debate and ideas? And one thing that just gets totally missed and, uh, by, 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 uh, by people in discussion is what a wonderful job some of these people do pointing out how ridiculous they are when you let them speak. That Ahmadinejad speech was fantastic. 
there were no gays in Iran. He, you, get, you, you got to hear all of that. And that was, that was just the one that really people, um, uh, uh, b people glommed onto. But there was crazy thing after crazy thing that he said in this speech, which is good to know. The informational value of knowing who, um, who these people, wh what these people you disagree with actually believe is part of the entire, uh, the entire idea. Um, shifting that immediately to, well, you're, you invited this crazy conspiracy theorist to talk about his crazy conspiracies, that means you advocate them. No, we want to hear the crazy, we want to hear what, what, what some of these people actually think, because you have to have confidence that a lot of these ideas, and I do have confidence, will utterly fail in the competition for ideas. Yeah, let me say quickly that I want to hear what you all have to say. Um, I think Benno makes a point that it's important to have an environment where really controversial speakers, even the Klan, come in and they're put in the context of the academic freedom narrative. And the problem is that on too many campuses, that side of the argument has not been given public presence. You've got to have people that give it public presence, whether it be the president of the university, uh, faculty members who are organized that have respect, and, and or students. And students are crucial in this battle. So there has to be that public presence so, and students understand it, so when a speaker comes in, they connect it to that narrative, not to the narrative, oh my God, this person's awful. We shouldn't hear them. Uh, university has no place for these people. Uh, second of all, uh, we talked about uh, having counter speakers come in, Anne's question. Uh, I think that's a good idea to be encouraged. Later on, there's a case study about where the panel itself was required mm -hmm. in order to have that diversity. I think that leads to the problems that Benno was talking about. Then you have university coercion forcing diversity rather than having diversity come about the right way. Right. So yeah, um, I, I'm very actually excited to move on to, to the next case study, but I'd definitely like to take questions. Yeah. Um, so, sir. Uh, well, I would say that the, as has been discussed, the the um, uh, Supreme Court law and and, and uh, 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 positions on academic freedom are really confused. Um, okay, what why don't you tell people what Bob Jones is is about? Uh, do if you remember, yeah, do, do you want to? Well, don't tell me. I, <coughs> I can or you can't. They're well, denied a tax benefit. Yeah. Uh, because of their uh, racial discriminatory policies. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's one of you. One of these things about the moving target of law is there's what a opinion actually says and what it comes to mean. Sometimes they're very different things, and more or less the Bob Jones case is largely treated as if you want the benefits of, of federal student aid or 501c free status or all these uh, benefits conferred, um, you have to abide by things like um, uh, the, the, the civil rights title. And that's, that's still considered to, be, uh, considered to be more or less what, what, Bob, uh, what Bob Jones means, even though in the opinion it's, it itself is sort of stated in a, in a sort of um, a not f fully formed way at that point. Yeah, I think it's rel relevant to our next case study yes. involving the funding of student groups. Uh, so it should come back then, but I, I oppose the Bob Jones case because I think it was a government kind of imposing an ideological orthodoxy uh, through the tax code. Uh, so uh, maybe in terms of the law, it's understandable, but in terms of policy, I, I found it personally questionable. And uh, Robert Cover wrote a great piece in law, Yale Law Journal back in 82 about nomos in the Constitution. But in America, groups are allowed to form their own worldviews as part of their freedom and freedom of association and how this case sort of compromised that. And Robert Cover, of course, was you know, a credentialed liberal uh, legal scholar. Are you talking about Obama coming to uh, President Obama coming to my campus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, I see. Um, well, it, it would certainly, if that speaker sort of represented the overwhelming ideology of that campus, I think even more so, because uh, then you would have more of an imposition of one point of view. And it does inter student academic rights. It does, would interfere with the rights of students to go to class, of teachers to teach. Uh, President Obama came to Madison uh, back in October. And uh, it was the first time ever, uh, it was the second time ever, we allowed a speaker to be on Bascom Hill. It's this hill that leads up from downtown up into the campus. <coughs> and uh, the first time we ever allowed an outside speaker to speak on Bascom Hill in terms of a large audience was ESPN, which raises the issue of sports, which I'd love to talk about later. <laughs> it's a huge issue, too. Uh, and uh, President Obama was the second one. Well, three of us, Ken Mayer and Althaus, and some of you might know as a famous blogger, and I uh, protested not him coming, which we thought was a great thing to have a president come to your campus, but um, uh, the way it was done. Uh, classes were shut down all over the place for a day or more uh, through that whole area. It was the nerve center of campus. Uh, in order to go to the event, you had to register with the campaign. And students started getting uh, emails asking for contributions by having done that. So that sort of raises at least a specter of what's called compelled association. And we objected to that. Interestingly, that was national news. And uh, the provost called us in later. And Ken Mayer and I explained to him our issues. And they ended up agreeing with us. So the university is now changing its policies on that because of the public embarrassment that occurred. Uh, but getting back you know, to the fundamentals of the question, I think it does raise uh, two issues. One would be the rights of other people. And two, um, maybe just you know reinforcing any kind of campus orthodoxy that might exist. Um, you know, I don't, not sure about the facts, but I think a similar situation may have come about at Yale. Maybe Philip or one of you out there would be more familiar with this. This was after my time, uh, and it was allegations uh, when the president uh, of China, Hu, Jin, Hu, Hu Jintao. Uh, the main leader uh, of the country and of the Communist Party there, came to Yale and spoke. In order to be in the audience, you had to register in advance. And it was alleged, again, I don't know if it's true, that the registration process, in effect, weeded out people uh, who were likely to challenge Hu Jintao uh, or, or to boo in certain sections uh, of what he said and created a kind of, you know, pre-selected, homogenous, <laughs> ideological, uh, or at least quiet um, um, audience. And it, if that if that is true, I would think it goes way too far. I, in other words, trying to protect speakers from the heckler's veto mm -hmm. does not mean that you keep people out uh, who may want to disagree as long as they don't do so in a way that disrupts the speaker's opportunity to, to get his or her uh, message uh, across. And I, I suspect what you're talking about happens more often than you would think, particularly in the situation where some foreign leaders involved from a country that has different, you know, different approach to uh, human rights or whatever than, than, than do we. I think Neil has a, qu has a question.
yeah, d the um, I, I think that it just to, to try to close out of the, out of the topic, I, one of the most telling cases I, I've seen over the years was at UCLA, where they were trying to have a meaningful debate on immigration. And it was a libertarian student group that was very, very pro, basically open borders group. But they decided to invite a uh, anti-immigration group, when I think so, like, uh, maybe it was a Minuteman p person, it, but I think it was something, it was someone who had a thoughtful anti, uh, you know, more of a closed border, <coughs> restricted border kind of kind of position. And they wanted to actually have a debate. And, the and, and students protested that the other side of the debate <coughs> being presented there so much that the university then claimed that the, uh, in order for the, uh, the, the anti-immigration, the, the closed borders people to be there, um, that they would have to pay something like $25,000 in security fees, which is of course established Supreme Court law. You can't just tax someone <coughs> out of not being able to speak at a school. Um, but I think that it's a deeper issue and something that I really try to hit in, uh, hit in my book that came out in October on Learning Liberty, is that the uh, something that's gone out of fashion is to st is the idea that intelligent people seek out the smart person they disagree with, and I th and that's something I've been hitting and I've been repeating over and over again. You're not really ed educated. You're not really intellectual <coughs> unless you're willing and actually uh, desire to engage people you disagree with. And I think that that's w so. So for example, when I speak on campus, we have tried hundreds of times to get people to debate me on, on, on college campuses. Um, my, my, uh, I have two former assistants here, they could, they could attest to the fact it's, it, it's happened exactly twice, and both times they've actually come in and said they agree with me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and, but it's not considered at some level you know, cool or fashionable to actually have both sides of the debate a lot of times on campuses these days. Yeah, that's the theme of Greg's book, which I recommend everybody read. And um, <coughs> I tell my students, it's not just that your education depends on different viewpoints. <coughs> it's boring without that. You have a boring education. It's incredibly dull. Absolutely. <coughs> um, th this is a topic uh, th that uh, FIRE has been very involved with. Um, hopefully you were able to read the, the case study. Um, and I'm just going to uh, you know, open up by talking about, um, if you had told me, I'm not, a re I'm, I'm not personally religious, I haven't been since seventh grade, if you had told me um, it, that before I worked at FIRE that um, there was a systematic and consistent attempt to kick evangelical Christians off campus, um, me, me you know, hiding out at Stanford in San Francisco would have said, oh, that's some kind of right-wing propaganda. I have been horrified at how systematic the attempt to kick evangelical Christians off campus has actually been, and I see it all the time. And at University <coughs> of Wisconsin, um, th there was a case that, that uh, Don and I uh, d d talked about and, and, and agreed on, where a uh, RA was trying to have a Bible study meeting in his own room at his own t on his own time, and he was told he couldn't, and the initial uh, reason he was given was that if students knew you were an evangelical Christian, they would not trust you, so it's fine that you're a Christian, just do that off campus where basically students can't see. And I went through this. Think about like, if someone said, told that to a Muslim student or a gay student. It's like it's fine that you're uh, or, or, or a Jewish student. It, it, it's fine that you're Jewish, but there's <coughs> we have some uh, tremendous anti-Semites on your floor. So please be Jewish off campus. That's just it's just insanity. But for some reason, it was okay to tell this to evangelical Christians. Now we've watched this pretext. We watched this, these different attempts, um, and universities always claim that these are uh, th these are policies that have uh, existed since time immemorial. And we've always beaten them uh, until CLS v. Martinez actually gave them gave gave uh, uh, Hastings University and universities across the country a tool that they could use to, to kick these students off. It was absolutely transparent that what they were what they were trying to do at Hastings was kick uh, CLS, a Christian Legal Society, off campus because they had a statement of faith that included that they believed um, that uh, th that man uh, that, that marriage should be between a, a man and a woman. Um, but they claim they had this policy forever, and the Supreme Court, in, a, in my opinion, a very wrong-headed, very convoluted opinion, came, da came to the conclusion that if you wanted to have a policy that prevented discrimination on the basis of belief, for a belief-based group, you could have that, but the only thing that, the only saving grace of this opinion was that you had to enforce it across the board. That means that the Democrats have to admit Republicans, that means that the, the environmentalists have to admit anti-environmentalists, that means that the conservative journal has to admit liberals. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that has prevented this, this opinion from being uh, all comers policies by being adopted in, in, in every school in the country so they could kick off the evangelicals, or at least the ones that are inclined to do that. Um, but amazingly enough, in the Ninth Circuit, 
Um, the one thing, uh, the, a case called Alpha, uh, Alpha Delta V Reed, they eliminated that one protection. They said you, it's okay if you only apply this against religious groups, uh, which will then be applied uh, against <coughs> Christian groups. So it, it's, it's, it's a pretty disastrous opinion. And we have cases at Vanderbilt, we have cases at Tufts that, that they talk about where Christian groups are, uh, are leaving, leaving in droves. Um, and uh, amazingly, for essentially in a lot of cases, the same beliefs that all, uh, that all other traditional religion, uh, re religious groups on campus have. Yeah, I think it's an example of the Supreme Court not really understanding the institution that it's adjudicating. Uh, so I, in principle, I think a case could be made for the Supreme Court decision. I disagree with it on freedom association grounds, but I can see the other side. Scenario one, a group is denied funding simply because of its beliefs. That happened at my school. Let's so I can tell you we've had more of these issues than any other campus maybe. <laughs> and they uh, overachieved. Uh, Scott Southworth. <laughs> Scott Southworth ended up in the Supreme Court, Board of Regents versus uh, Southworth. And he was denied funding in 1995. I happened to be in that room watching that at the time uh, because simply of their beliefs uh, as a conservative Christian group. Clearly constitutional no-no. Scenario two, you're allowed to have that belief you will get funding, but you cannot physically exclude people from joining your group uh, on grounds of you know, race, gender, religion, sex, et cetera. <coughs> That's action, not belief. And I think a stronger case could be made for why scenario one is unconstitutional than for scenario two, because you are getting into universities' valid policies about anti-discrimination, right. which I'll be talking about later as one form of responsibility, all right? The problem is that, as Greg says, the two bleed into each other. And, in the real w and also, you do have this thing called freedom of association, which does mean the power to exclude. So I would argue there's sort of a clash here between two valid principles equal protection, anti-discriminatory action versus um, freedom of association. Because of what universities are, I would favor freedom of association, so I'm with Greg. I wish the court had gone the other way, both in principle and in terms of its consequences. But I can see why there is reasoning in the other side. Right. And I just want to ex explain one thing quickly. The status versus belief distinction, and this is something that courts have recognized, this is something that courts have been able to adjudicate. Um, th and the idea is that your status, for, for example, your status of racial status, there's nothing about being African American, there's nothing about being Hispanic that means you can't be a Republican, that you can't join the Trust Club, that you can't join a Catholic group, um, that means you can't have a certain set of beliefs. But belief-based <coughs> organizations are inherently discriminatory on the basis of belief. <coughs> um, and that freedom of expression means very little if you can't um, exclude people who are utterly hostile to your, uh, utterly hostile to your message. Yeah, and very quickly, they also bring in freedom of, uh, of establishment of religion issues, First Amendment issues that we want to restrict religious groups because if we facilitate them too much, we're violating the Establishment Clause. That's come up too. Yeah. Hey, so would you go to page, if you would sure. kindly go to page 71, because we've got some questions for consideration there, and I'd yeah. like to hear you guys walk <coughs> through those questions as to how you would approach them. Given that all college or university is not required to establish all comers policies in the wake of CLS, what would you be the rationale for doing so? Um, what is the potential benefit or harm for such a policy? I think it's crazy to adopt an all comers policy, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, universities have, have largely uh, avoided doing so, because that would mean that the administration and general counsels would have to actually go with a straight face and tell the college Republicans that I know um, that, that Democrat likes to come to your meetings and just sort of raise trouble or just um, want to find out what your plans are for, for the fall, or I know that you, um, you're you a progressive journal and that conservative wants to write for you and you can't stop them. It requires such policing on such a high level if, you're, if you sincerely want to fulfill um, the requirements of CLSB Martinez as to be impractical. Unfortunately, th but that's one of the protections against it being adopted by everybody. Unfortunately, California, um, the Ninth Circuit, has actually undone that one great protection to, to it, and it now can be enforced against religious groups. But even when it's only enforced against religious groups, I, and I talk about this in the, in, in the book, um, we, we defend everybody fire always has, and we've uh, and in very similar situations when Muslim groups have had statements of faith, we have come, we had a case at Louisiana State University where we got involved and we told the university that, that when they de-recognized the Muslim Student Association because they had a statement of faith that included them believing that homosexuality is sinful, um, that, uh, that that was wrong. That's their belief and they should be allowed to organize around that belief. And it was amazing watching Louisiana State University do this sort of, you're right, we don't, uh, if we actually believe in diversity, we actually believe in a pluralist society, that we shouldn't be telling the Muslim Student Association what they should do um, and what they should believe. 
And I just remember like sort of shaking my head and having dealt with dozens and dozens of cases involving evangelicals exactly like this. I'm like, that's great. Now, if you could just understand that when it applies to evangelicals, then we're set. Three benefits, like if I were an official trying to support it. Anti-discriminatory policy, um, diversity of ideas, let's get groups that have different viewpoints in the same group to disagree, and uh, finally, opportunity for leadership, that uh, there's more opportunity for students to have leadership experience by being able to join any group they want. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem and the harm is that this is largely a pretext yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, for the things that Greg's talking about. Yeah, and the second question is, if a university has a non-discrimination policy, can it still allow religious, political, or other campus groups to determine membership on the basis of student beliefs? Uh, yes, um, that, that, that's actually what UNC, UNC adopted. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 we, we had a number of cases um, in, the, in the University of North Carolina system where they were time and time again trying to de-recognize different Christian groups. And my favorite attempt was when they tried to de-recognize a specifically, literally evangelical group, where the idea was that you go door to door <laughs> evangelizing uh, your, 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 uh, your beliefs, and they were trying to make the point that it does it, that you could do this effectively even if you didn't believe Jesus Christ was Savior. And I was just always going through how interesting that, that, that pitch would be at someone's door saying, it's like, well, I don't believe in this myself. <laughs> you should convert to evangelical Christianity. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, you can have that, and, it, and, it, and the language can be very straightforward that if if uh, the ex uh, that you can exclude people if they do not believe with the, with the tenets of the group. Yeah, I agree. Nothing more to add, really. Yeah. Well, uh, it's eleven o'clock. Uh, we we're, we're going to have a, a short break until eleven fifteen. If we could uh, all be back in the room promptly by then, but uh, let's thank uh, Don and Greg for a very stimulating discussion. <laughs>